we've all been warned. Um, it's uh, it's going in the official record now. Um, and uh, Jerry will will introduce our, our our speaker in a moment. I just want to let folks know um, uh, one. Just want to thank you all for for joining us tonight. Um, we uh, we ask folks to um, uh, try to stay on microphone mute during the presentation. If you have a question or a comment, um, uh, please use the chat um, and uh, I'll be, myself and Jerry will be looking through the, the, the chat trying to, and to, to monitor if there's any questions so they don't slip through. Um, and I should ask, um, John, would, would you like us to hold all questions towards the end or if we see something that, that seems sort of pertinent to the, the moment, should we try to interject? What would be your preference? Um, if, yeah, if there's something hot that they want answered, we can, we can do it in the middle, but then otherwise we could hold them to the end and have a nice, uh, question and answer session and a discussion. Okay. Okay. That's what we'll do. And, but if we, if it seems hot, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of interject. So folks, please feel free to use that chat function. Uh, if you want to get a comment in just so it's on record, so we can keep it for the conversation at the end. Um, and, um, I think that is it for, for my end. Um, and uh, Jerry, why don't I pass it over to you? Okay, the next speaker is Dr. John Hardig, and the topic is Michigan's long history of riding an environmental roller coaster. Um, as in the way of biography, um, during 2017 and 18, Dr. Hartig served as a Fulbright Scholar at the Bissetti School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Ontario. For 14 years, he served as refuge manager for the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. John has received a number of awards for his work, including the 2017 Community Peacemaker Award from Wayne State University Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, the 2016 Edward G. Voss Conservation Science Award from Michigan Nature Association, the 2015 Conservationist of the Year Award from the John Muir Association and the 2013 Conservation Advocate of the Year Award from the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. Dr. John Hardig is currently a visiting scholar at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research at the University of Windsor. The focus of his Fulbright is multidisciplinary research on cleanup of the Great Lakes Dr. Hardig also serves as the Great Lakes Science Policy Advisor for the International Association. Sorry about that. Uh, for the advisor for the International Association for Great Lakes Research. So without further ado and interruption, Mr. Hardig. Hey, well, great to be with all of you tonight. Uh, let me get this up and running. Um, um, it is a real pleasure to be with you tonight. Is that full screen for everyone, Jerry and Garrett? Can you see that? Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, um, real pleasure to be with you. And, uh, you know, thank you for all you do as part of Sierra Club. I mean, from, you know, protecting wilderness areas like uh, 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 Sequoia and, and unique places, national parks, to advocating for clearing air, for opposing coal and dams, and, uh, and just, uh, and many things locally here. You, it, I can't thank you enough for all you do for the environment, for all species, and for future generations. So when Jerry and I were talking on the phone, you know, I, I, I wanted to sort of have a, a different talk tonight about, you know, uh, like Jerry said, Michigan's long history of in, riding an environmental roller coaster. So think about this, close your eyes for a moment and imagine you are on a roller coaster ascending the first and highest hill on the ride. You hear the click, click, click as the car climbs to the top and you start getting excited, even nervous, the closer you get to the peak. Then the car reaches the pinnacle, and for a moment you feel suspended, as if everything has paused. But it doesn't last long, and suddenly you begin your white-knuckled descent, screaming in part fear and in part excitement until you reach the bottom. You go up and you go down. The higher you rise, the further and faster you seem to fall. 
Like that up and down journey, Michigan's struggle with toxic substances crises has many peaks and valleys. And I'd like to share 10 of those stories with you tonight and talk about maybe what needs to be done to do a better job of getting off this roller coaster ride. We like to use the metaphor of ecosystem health. You're going to go in and get a checkup from your doctor, and, and he, she or he will assess how healthy you are. You'll, you'll get a feeling for just um, uh, your, the state of your health, the condition of your health. Well, that same, that metaphor is, is real applicable to the Great Lakes and ecosystems. So it is the state or condition of an ecosystem. So keeping with that roller coaster metaphor, the top of a lift hill is equivalent to relatively high ecosystem health, where it's sort of a high state of health. As the car rapidly descends from the top of the hill because of a toxic substance crisis, ecosystem health diminishes rapidly. As the car slowly ascends the next hill, ecosystem health slowly improves until another toxic substance crisis occurs, plunging the car down again, symbolizing another rapid decrease in ecosystem health. In Michigan, a number of these incidents stand out. Uh, um, the first one is sort of think of right after World War II. And of course, Detroit was ground zero because we were the arsenal of democracy. You know, more Jeeps, more bombers, more tanks, more ammunition came out of Detroit than any other city in the United States. And right at the end of the war, right after the war, in 46 through 48, um, they quantified how much oil and petroleum products were being discharged to the Rouge and subsequently the Detroit rivers each year. That number was 5.9 million gallons of oil and petroleum products. It takes one gallon of oil to pollute a million gallons of water. So that 5.9 million gallons of oil and petroleum products was enough to pollute the entire western basin of Lake Erie, all Michigan waters, all Ohio waters, all Ontario waters. Um, the winter of 1948 was a cold one, sort of like what we had a cold spell this winter, and there was lots of ice on the river, and there was only a few open pockets of, of water left. And of course, what was floating in those open pockets of water was uh, uh, oil and, and petroleum products. And the ducks, as they had done for millennia, came down on their uh, southern migration, and they stop you know, along the Detroit River to feed on, uh, to rest and feed. Uh, the, the diving ducks in particular love the wild celery that's in the Detroit River. So... Uh, uh, they came down, they landed in these few pockets of open water that were filled with oil, and uh, 11,000 ducks and geese died in a single event. A group of duck hunters from uh, uh, Wyandotte, Trenton, Gibraltar collected those oil-soaked carcasses of, of ducks and geese, threw them in their pickup trucks, drove them to Lansing and the capital, and started throwing them on the sidewalk leading up to the ca Capitol, threw them on the front steps of the Capitol and called a press conference and said, how dare you do this to the place where we're raising our families, the place we call home. Today, these um, duck hunters that uh, spoke out loudly are credited with starting the Industrial Pollution Control Program of Michigan. Ah, uh, a great story. That story, by the way, is on a um, historical marker at the Refuge Gateway in Trenton, which is the where the visitor center is for the Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge. Uh, and it's the first marker on uh, uh, Michigan's uh, conservation trail. The next story, um, there was an ornithologist at Michigan State University. His name was uh, George Wallace. And um, it was the 
early 50s at this point. And George Wallace noticed that robins were dying on campus, right on campus, on the lawns, following uh, DDT application. And so George went in and looked into that. He did some of the fundamental research, uh, uh, first research on DDT, uh, showing a cause and effect linkage between DDT and potentially other organochlorine pesticides and uh, reproductive problems in birds. And so uh, his, his work was so significant that uh, it was even cited in Rachel Carson's 1962 uh, classic book called Silent Spring that really awakened the nation to the effects of release of all these chemicals into our rivers, lakes, and oceans, and biomagnifying in all life. Not only were songbirds like robins vanishing from DDT exposure, but also uh, bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and osprey were, uh, um, were experiencing eggshell thinning. And, and then in addition, DDT was concentrated in fish and endangering uh, the humans who consume them. Just as a visual, the egg on the left is a peregrine falcon left uh, egg that is normal. The one on the right is one that is exposed to DDT, and you can see the signs there of eggshell thinning because of DDT and other um, organochlorine pesticides. Uh, shortly after that, um, a husband and wife named Norm and Barbara Spring would sit on their front porch across from a park in Grand Haven, Michigan. And they started noticing that the robins were trembling in the grass, literally shaking and then dying. And noticed also that, as this picture shows, that they were spraying for uh, Dutch elm disease in their neighborhood. And you can see the, the, the truck doing that right there in the right-hand picture. So Norm was so upset with this that he marched down to City Hall and pleaded with the city council to stop the use of DDT. Um, he was persistent. He would not give up. So he attended meeting after meeting uh, uh, for three years, and eventually they paid enough attention and they stopped the use of DDT in Grand Haven, Michigan. Uh, a nearby community, we all know Holland, um, came to Norm Spring and said, how did you do this? We are seeing the same things in Holland. So activists from uh, um, Holland got together with Norm and his wife, Barbara, and they brought in George Wallace, the one who did the primary research from Michigan State University. And they established this Michigan Pesticides Council to advocate for um, stopping to use these kinds of chemicals. As a result of their grassroots campaign, Michigan became the first state to ban DDT in 1969. So think about that. They were the first state in the United States to do that. And three years before it was banned nationally in 1972. So Michigan was ahead of the curve. Uh, fast forward, uh, both uh, uh, Norm Spring and one of his colleagues on this Michigan Pesticides Council, who some of you may know, Joan Wolf, an advocate, uh, environmental advocate, uh, were added to the West Michigan Environmental Hall of Fame for their grassroots leadership in banning DDT and other hard pesticides. A uh, few years later in that decade, you know, uh, Southeast Michigan, uh, many of you will remember the Rouge River caught on fire. Again, there was so much oil going in from those industries still. Um, um, in the 60s, there was a one event where 7,000 ducks died in a weekend, and another one where 12,000 waterfowl died, um, all attributed to oil. Um, so uh, all that oil was on the river, and there was wooden debris on the river, 
and um, the wooden debris was soaked in oil and a worker dropped an acetylene torch. Uh, the flame shot 50 feet in the air. It took 10 pieces of Detroit Fire Department equipment and, um, and the John Kendall, this is the picture on your screen right now, the fireboat at the time called the John Kendall to contain the fire. You don't really put out a river on fire. You contain it and let it burn, uh, burn out on its own. But that was 19, October 9th, 1969. The Free Press said a couple of days later, when you have a river that burns for crying out loud, you have troubles. It happened on Cleveland's Cuyahoga, and now it has happened on the Rouge River. Um, 1970, uh, um, there was a graduate student at the University of Western Ontario who came over from Scandinavia, Scandinavia and he was studying uh, mercury cycling in Scandinavian lakes. And he noticed that um, uh, Lake St. Clair had upstream this petrochemical valley, which is Sarnia, Ontario, a big chemical industry. And they were producing uh, uh, chlorine and chlorine products. And they had a mercury cell operation. The byproduct of that process of producing chlorine was elemental mercury and what was happening to it. So he went out and sampled the fish in Lake St. Clair, and it came back four to five times the safe standard for human consumption. Uh, governments on both sides of the border went out and um, confirmed that, in fact, the fishery was contaminated. And that news catapulted across the world. They had to ban the human consumption of fish from the St. Clair River, Lake St. Clair, Detroit River, and Western Lake Erie. And that was the mercury crisis of 1970. So the primary source was Dow Chemical, its chloralkali plant. Um, and it operated from 1949 until it closed because of the mercury crisis in 1970. An estimated 100 tons of mercury were released. Think about that, 100 tons of mercury released to the St. Clair River, which flowed downstream to Lake St. Clair, which flowed downstream to Detroit River, and then Western Lake Erie. Uh, since the, this chloralkali plant was shut down, the, uh, Dow has spent over 75 million to control mercury sources and sewers, drains, and landfills on their property. Uh, between 2001, in 2005, Dow remediated approximately 18,300 cubic yards of mercury-contaminated sediment uh, in the river at a cost of $18 million. But that was not the only sort of mercury cell operation. There was an old Wyandotte Chemical Company uh, uh, in Wyandotte on the Trenton Channel of the Detroit River. Same process. And obviously, elemental mercury was being discharged to the Detroit River. It, too, was shut down in 1972. And now, tracking mercury, mercury levels in Lake St. Clair walleye have declined by 80%, although there are still health advisories in effect for certain species and certain size classes. So think about it here almost. 50 years later, and we're still seeing the effects of the mercury crisis of 1970. The next one, uh, 1973, um, it was called the PBB crisis, polybrominated biphenyls. There was a chemical company called Velsicol that was located in uh, St. Louis, Michigan, and they made a mistake and shipped this toxic flame retardant chemical called polybrominated biphenyl, PBB, to a livestock feed plant. Oh my goodness. It took over a year to discover this mistake. By then, millions of Michigans had Michiganders had consumed contaminated beef, chicken, pork, milk, and eggs. 
some 1.5 million chickens, 300,000 cattle, 5,900 pigs, and 1,470 sheep had to be disposed of in landfills. And here you see one of the pictures of getting rid of some of the cattle and, and other animals in those, um, those canisters. Um, uh, it, it was estimated between 1971 and 73, approximately 269,000 pounds of waste materials containing 60%, 70% PBB were disposed of in this one nearby landfill called the Gratiot County Landfill. These PBB contaminated waste ended up contaminating both adjacent groundwater and surface waters, including the Pine River, the nearby Pine River. The state eventually had to issue a health advisory banning the human consumption of all fish from the Pine River downstream of St. Louis due to PBB contamination. The uh, pictures here are just riveting from that time of putting these cattle and other animals contaminated with PBB into these landfills. Next crisis was late 1970s, and uh, it was the dioxin crisis in, from Dow Chemical in Midland. Um, uh, in 78, uh, Dow Chemical informed both Michigan Department of Natural Resources and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that rainbow trout exposed to a mixture of Dow's treated effluent prior to discharge to the Titabawassee River accumulated significant levels of 2378 tetrachlorodibenzodioxin. So that's called TCDD for short. TCDD is one of the most toxic compounds known. Um, and it is well established that it damages reproductive and immune systems and causes cancer. So they informed the state and federal government, and um, th this, these results prompted the Michigan Department of Public Health to issue an advisory that same year, warning against human consumption of any fish collected from the Titabawassee River downstream of Dow and the Saginaw River before it empties into Saginaw Bay. The advisory remained in effect until 1986 when the Michigan Department of Public Health modified it to apply only to catfish and carp. Um, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, um, Dow uh, has been involved in the cleanup of the site for literally decades. Uh, the area uh, is on uh, the federal Superfund list for hazardous sites. Um, only recently has an agreement been reached on the cleanup of these contaminated sediments in the Titabawassee River and the floodplains, but then the unthinkable happened. Usually when we talk about rivers and um, impoundments and tributaries, we talk about once in 100 year floods. Every once in a while, you'll hear about a once in 200 year flood. But in May of 2020, less than one year ago, there was a one in once in 500 year flood because of a couple dam failures that caused the evacuation of over 10,000 people in Midland. Obviously, what happened to all those sediments in the bottom of the river and the sediments in the floodplain that were contaminated. Obviously, there's lots of concern and fear for how this flood moved and spread these contaminants further downstream and into flood floodplains that were previously, uh, were not previously contaminated. It's an amazing picture of that flood on the right. Uh, next one is a uh, hooker chemical company on White Lake up on uh, the Eastern shore of Lake Michigan. Um, uh, hooker operated the plant in Montague there from 1952 to 83, after which it was purchased by Occidental Chemical. Um, and uh, Hooker produced uh, chlorine, sodium hydroxide, 
uh, hydrochloric acid, and a compound called hexachloropentadiene. Uh, so for short, it's called C56. Um, and this was a building block of the hard pesticides like Myrex, Keepone, and flame retardants. So uh, Hooker terminated production of this C56 in 1977, and all chem chemical manufacturing stopped in uh, 82. Then the late 70s, the Michigan DNR estimated that approximately 368 kilograms per day of chlorinated hydrocarbons were entering White Lake from Hooker property, and that several wells were contaminated. So these contaminants were moving in through contaminated groundwater into White Lake. Um, in 1979, the state of Michigan filed lawsuit against Hooker. The site was cleaned up in 81 to 82, so that meant some of the waste was contained. They also put in a series of purge wells to capture the contaminated groundwater before it reached the lake. Uh, 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 the bulk of the contaminated surface soil was placed in on-site land line fill, uh, which is maintained through a long-term management plan. Um, the ten, this 10-acre 10 landfill contains approximately 90, 970,000 tons of contaminated soil. Um, a 1993 Occidental Chemical, now they're the ones who took over from Hooker, Occidental Chemical, they signed an administrative order with US EPA to investigate the contamination and implement further corrective actions. Uh, the remedy was agreed to in 2001, and all remediation was completed in 2005. Groundwater and waste disposal vault monitoring continue on this site. Uh, um, it is still out there, and all those contaminants are still in those landfills and in those soils. Uh, in mid-1985, I was actually working with the International Joint Commission in Windsor, Ontario, and we had a, uh, uh, our offices were up on the seventh floor of one of the buildings right off the river, and we could add, we had this beautiful view of, of the Detroit River, and we could all see all the way up to uh, Lake St. Clair, and in 85, uh, a large dry cleaning solvent spill occurred on the St. Clair River from some of the chemical industries in this petrochemical valley that I talked about in Sar Sarnia. It was estimated at the time over 2,900 gallons of perchloroethylene uh, uh, were released into the river due to a faulty valve on a pipeline. So perchloroethylene is like the, you know, think of you go to a dry cleaners and they talk about perk, perchloroethylene as the cleaning solvent. Uh, because perchloroethylene is heavier than the water, it's settled in a great mass on the bottom of the river, and it became branded the blob in 1985. Uh, uh, the, the blob was discovered by uh, some of my colleagues at the University of Windsor at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research, who were, uh, uh, who were diving in the river sediments down there, and they noticed this big blob. Um, and that this blob had trace amounts of dioxin in it, as well as perchloroethylene. This attracted national media attention and resulted in the temporary closure of all municipal water intakes uh, from the St. Clair River uh, on the Canadian side of Lake St. Clair and the Detroit River. Um, Dow recovered most of the spill, spilled substance uh, vacuumed it off the bottom of the river, changed its industrial practice, uh, practices, and was fined a mere $11,500 for spilling a hazardous waste into the river. That's the story of the blob. Um, more recently, we all are keenly aware of the Flint water crisis or the Flint water tragedy. In 2014, Flint made an ill-fated cost-cutting decision to switch water sources from the Detroit regional water system that drew its water from southern Lake Huron to the Flint River. 
Now the Flint River water was too caustic for GM to use in its manufacturing process, but it, they switched over and used it for drinking water. What a decision. Soon after Flint residents started complaining that the water from their taps looked, smelled and tasted foul. Here you can see the color coming out of the tap in people's houses. Despite protests of residents, officials maintain that the water was safe. Then a Virginia Tech University researcher came in and revealed that the water was in fact uh, contaminated with high concentrations of lead. Lead is known to cause anemia, weakness, and kidney and brain damage. Water samples collected from 252 homes revealed nearly 17% of the samples were above the federal action level of 15 parts per billion, the level at which corrective action must take. More than 40% measured above five parts per billion of lead, which researchers deemed very serious from a human health perspective. Um, at that point, a pediatrician named Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha came into the equation and started looking at the blood in children who from Flint that were drinking mere tap water and discovered elevated blood levels. In fact, just between in one year, looking at what the levels were in 2014 and the 2015, there was almost a doubling of the lead levels in children's um, uh, blood. Um, in some neighborhoods, they discovered that had nearly tripled in that time frame in one year. So eventually they Experts reported that nearly 9,000 Flint children were drinking uh, lead contaminated water for 18 months. Uh, then in 2015, uh, Flint switched its water back to the Detroit water system, which means taking their water from Southern Lake Huron, which is the same system that much of uh, Southeast Michigan is on. Um, and now, of course, it's been for uh, a number of years replacing lead and galvanized water lines and encouraging users to use water filters. Um, State of Michigan has also a new lead and copper rule representing the strictest water standard in the nation. But in the last couple of months, we all read in the paper, there was a $641 million settlement uh, to aid those affected by the Flint water tragedy, the crisis. 79.5% of settlement funds will be spent on minors. 64.5% will be directed to children under the age of seven. 10% will benefit children ages seven to 11. And 5% will benefit children ages 12 to 17. Um, concern for long-term effects of lead exposure, particularly to these young children, remains very, very high. But we're not done. As you know, we had the PFAS crisis in the Huron River. This is per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, these are called forever chemicals because they last uh, uh, forever. They, are, they were commercially used starting in the 1950s as a product to repel water, protect surfaces, resist heat, and other properties. But they are linked to harmful health effects, including cancer, immune system dysfunction, liver damage, developmental and reproductive harm, and hormone disruption. Uh, since 2006, PFAS uh, have been regulated, largely phased out because of use, uh, out of use in the United States under a voluntary agreement. In 2017, PFAS contamination of drinking water and fish was discovered in the Huron River. And, um, and now it has been discovered in many watersheds throughout the United States. But as a result of that, the Michigan Department of Community Health had to issue a do not eat advisory for all fish in the Huron River. 
And so communities along the Huron River now are fighting to eliminate all sources of PFAS and clean up the river. PFAS is now found in the blood of almost 90% of all Americans and have, uh, and have even been found in the polar bears up in the Arctic. Um, so big question, how can we get off this roller coaster? We go up, we go to a healthful laser and we hit a toxic substance crisis and we come down rapidly. Things start getting a little bit better. We go up the roller coaster, another one hits and we go down. We go up, we go down. How do we do that? We have some tools in the toolbox that give us some advice. Uh, one of them is the Canada-US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that calls for the virtual elimination of the discharge of persistent toxic substances with the philosophy of zero discharge. So zero discharge means eliminate the inputs of all persistent toxic substances. Virtual elimination is an overall strategy to eliminate the present presence of persistent toxic substances in the Great Lakes ecosystem. The agreement, this Canada-US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement takes it one step further and calls for strengthened measures to anticipate and prevent ecological harm from these persistent toxic substances. A couple of, William McDonough is a uh, uh, industrial designer, architect, and a big picture thinker. And one of his colleagues is Michael uh, Braungart. And they've provided a blueprint for achieving this in their book called Cradle to Cradle, Rethinking the Way We Make Things. They argue that waste is a product of poor design and promote that waste is a food, that there is no way and that everything is part of a cycle. Their solution is switching from cradle to grave. We used, everyone used to preach that for, for many, many decades, from cradle to disposal in a landfill, cradle to grave approach, switching from that to making things to a cradle to cradle approach that achieves a circular economy, eliminates waste, and ensures the continuous use of resources. Uh, uh, McDonough and Braungart believe that we do not have a pollution problem, but a design problem. Instead of trying to design something that is less bad, we should be designing things that are better from the start. The cradle to cradle process looks at the entire life cycle of a product from extraction of raw materials to what happens to the materials after a person is finished using the product. Recycling converts the material into something of roughly the same value as it originally was. Downcycling converts material into something of less value than it originally was. Upcycling converts the material into something of greater value than it originally was. So cradle to cradle promotes upcycling with the optimal, optimal goal of endless recycling of all the materials in a product. Uh, the 10 examples that I shared with you today of environmental uh, crises in Michigan should give each of us pause and motivation to ensure that we are using a cradle to cradle approach that anticipates and prevents uh, pollution and ecological harm. It could start with a strong and clear cradle to cradle policy that creates a sense of shared purpose and guides behavior. Here's an example how Amazon is buying into the cradle to cradle approach. Um, all decisions about design of products should be made based on the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle states that when human activities may lead to unacceptable harm that is scientifically plausible, but uncertain, there's some uncertainty there, actions should be taken to avoid or diminish that harm. This cool political cartoon here is a good example of that. On the left, you've got uh, 
sort of uh, these the way from the middle, you got two frogs in a proverbial hot tub and being boiled. And, and the one on the left says, and he's arguing burden of proof. When we get, we will get out. When you prove we will be boiled alive. On the right, you see the precautionary principle. We should get out until you can prove we won't be boiled alive. Um, everything should be guided by the precautionary principle. Another perspective on this whole um, thought process comes from the cleanup of the most polluted areas of the Great Lakes. Jerry uh, Hasbatcher sort of uh, talked about that a little bit about, I've been looking at these 43 most polluted areas of the Great Lakes and they started a cleanup program back in 1985 called Remedial Action Plans. And between 1985 and 2019, a total of $22.8 billion was spent on cleanup just thus far of these areas of concern. Now that totals up all the expenditures on the Canadian side with the US side, converts the Canadian dollars, the US dollars. That number is a big number, $22.8 billion spent thus far. So these, um, so this one of the conclusions of this study is that pollution prevention investments should be viewed as spending to avoid future cleanups. We don't ever want to have to go through another exercise where we identify the most polluted areas of the Great Lakes and spend um, tens of billions of dollars on cleanup. The whole message here is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, um, this is the quote I like uh, most, and it comes from that uh, uh, industrial designer from cradle to gravel, uh, William McDonough. There are millions of difficult challenges and delightful opportunities ahead. I can think, I think the only constraint is the willingness to dream, to create and to hope and feel undefended enough to face the tough questions and ideas that must be fiercely engaged at this moment in human history. If design is the signal of human intention, let me say that again. If design is the signal of human intention, then we must continuously ask ourselves, what are our intentions for our children, for the children of all species and for all time? And how do we profitably and boldly manifest the best of those intentions? Um, so I asked you, how do we get off this toxics roller coaster? Next question, when do we get off of it? Um, it's been 10 ups and downs on just the stories I shared with you. Um, I think what we need to do is um, reach out to the state of Michigan, just like it was a leader on DDT, just it, like it was a leader on other issues in the Great Lakes to have a cradle to cradle policy to officially adopt the precautionary principle and to avoid the next uh, toxic substances crisis and the next tipping point for the Great Lakes. So with that, I, I will stop screen sharing and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, Garrett, if I could, I mean, just you know, think about this. We, Michigan, you know, like, uh, I mean, they've had leadership in the past on some really tough decisions. But how many of these up and down cycles do we have to go through before we learn that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? What is the policy relative to this in the state of Michigan? Um, how do we, and there's no better organization, and I would be happy to work with uh, Sierra Club to advocate for this. Really appreciate you, you like framing it that way. And, and, you know, as I was thinking about sort of policy to advocate for, and, and you know, it, it seems so elegant to sort of propose that precautionary principle, 
Um, and uh, I, I guess I'll just ask you, are there examples that you can point to of, of um, like policy either at the state level or at the federal level that, that kind of show the precautionary principle sort of in action in sort of policy or legislation? Uh, I don't have any, unfortunately, off the top mm -hmm. of my head. Mm -hmm. It's not, I don't have any quick and easy answer for that. There may be some where um, a chemical was proposed for use. It went before, you know, Toxic Substances Control Commission and Michigan Eagle or before them, Michigan DEQ, and they didn't allow the production of that chemical. Um, uh, I think, you know, like when I, I just think of how, you know, that George Wallace from Michigan State University that, you know, he discovers these robins dying on campus because of DDT spraying. And then, and then the, the other examples, um, they acted quickly to ban DDT three years before the federal government did it for the whole country. So they have they have this history of be, have taking a strong stand and we are the heart of the Great Lakes. We have four of the Great Lakes. You know, we, what better state to be a leader on this um, than the state of Michigan? Well, I, I also appreciate that, that ending quote, the way it, it encouraged us to, to sort of be energized, be inspired about trying to like really move forward with these creative solutions, because it can be discouraging, I think, when you, you talk about that roller coaster cycle, and it can be discouraging to think like, how many more times do we need to like, like suffer these consequences, um, or see people that are suffering these consequences, um, and, and not get it. So I, I really appreciate, you know, that sort of like ending on sort of this hopeful mo note of like working together to, to move forward. Um, and, and if I could, there is actually, I, I see there's some, some questions and comments that folks have been putting in the chat and uh, Dave Richards had sent me one to, to ask you, John, um, but I don't, I think it was just to me. So I'm going to, I'm going to like convey that over to you. Um, his question is, um, in terms of like the Michigan history as the automobile capital, um, can you share anything about like the Michigan role as it relates to lead gasoline and, and the eventual sort of removal of lead from gasoline? Yeah, you know, we had uh, lots of, um, obviously lead was in a lot of compounds. You know, we still have lead issues in, in some of the old urban areas because, you know, lead in paint and kids and children consume the little chips of lead paint. And, you know, you, you just can't get rid of lead once it gets in a human body, you know, you can't just, um, so, um, but gasoline, you know, when they banned it, you know, they, they first looked at the roadside ditches, you know, think of all these cars and trucks going up down these roads and how high uh, lead was in these ditches. And they were able to track you know, a, re, a, a fairly rapid decline in those. And then, of course, in air, we've in the air monitoring, it showed up as well, where the air, the lead levels in air decreased as a result of banning it. So um, uh, um, obviously, the, you know, there's, there was probably resistance to that up front because we are the automobile capital of the United States, right, you know, but it, it happened. And there were some positive things that uh, uh, I think if you look at the some of these companies, whether it's the chemical sector, like, you know, the people who came in and bought out Wyandotte chemicals, BASF, and they're a leader in pollution prevention and control of contaminants at source. Um, you look at, you know, the the Ford Rouge plant, and you know, it's a 21st century model of sustainable manufacturing. So there's a lot going on. And I think some of these industries, at least the ethical ones, are looking at and saying, do we really want to go through another cleanup? You know, something like the mercury crisis of 1970 or the, you know, or the, the hooker situation or the PBB, you take any one of those and you look at the cost of cleanup and, and, and it doesn't go away, right? We're still concerned about those contaminants now, 50 years later.
well, to, to pull from the chat, I just want to, uh, one person did uh, um, throw in there mentioning uh, you forgot Kalamazoo's Enbridge, Enbridge spill. So we can Absolutely. add 11th to the list, right? If we need like another knock in the head to get us to. Yeah, there, there's uh, two of them. Thank you for bringing that up. That was huge. You know, I mean, I mean, the Enbridge oil spill is, is one. And then how many of you remember? Oh, I can't remember now. 15 to 20 years ago, there was a spill. It was called a mystery spill on the Rouge River where, you know, couple hundred thousand gallons of oil came in and and you know and they said well i i remember um i was working with the coast guard at that time on that and they said because the flow of the detroit river was so strong that it would hug the shoreline and we'll boom off these areas we'll get the oil and we'll contain it and make the cleanup less well that oil went all the way over to the canadian side there was a million dollars of cleanup on the Canadian side on the lower end of the Detroit River, six million dollars on the U.S. side, seven million dollars uh, for something. And then, they'll, you know, they, uh, the fines and penalties are always so incredibly low relative to the cost to clean up and to do it right. So, again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Thank you for bringing up the Kalamazoo oil spill. That, that is major. We have a question in here. Uh, what role does Ontario have in making changes in concert with Michigan? We have to go lockstep. We cannot go, you know, we can't go this alone. I mean, we share, we share the Detroit River. We share Western Lake Erie. We share Lake St. Clair. We share Lake Huron. You know, if, if one side only does one thing and the other side doesn't do it, we're not getting to where we need to be. So we have to go lockstep. And hence, that's why we have the International Joint Commission, why we have the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. It's, the, uh, it's been labeled the first environmental agreement. We have over a century of cooperation on that. We have the Canada-US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that was first signed in 1972. Um, it'll be 50 years next year on that. And, but we need to be continuous and vigorous oversight on keep hold each other's each side of the border accountable. Um, and look at climate change. Now climate change is exasperating all of these environmental issues. have a, a, a comment and then a couple more questions in here, but uh, in terms of like the um, pretty minimal and insufficient fines for folks, uh, Dave Cottrell is mentioning that there's a there's lead in the soil at the old Ethel Corporation site in Ferndale at Eight Mile and Pinecrest. Um, and, you know, just pointing out that the Ethel Corporation is still in existence and has not had to clean up its, uh, its mess over there. That's right. And if you look in Detroit, you know, like in Southeast Michigan, there are many areas where you can't have uh you have to have raised beds in your garden, right? And why do you have to have raised beds in your garden? Because of some of the historical uh, lead and other toxic substances contamination that's down there. So yeah, um, yeah, I mean, polluter pays, number one, that's a really good point. And, 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 and they have to be made to feel the pain of this. You know, they have to pay for the cleanup and there has to be incentive not to continue that practice, you know. Shannon asks, uh, what is the best map of Superfund slash contaminated sites in Michigan and the rest of the Great Lakes region? The map of it, you know, the both uh, US EPA and Michigan Eagle maintain maps by geographical area. And obviously there are a lot of them in Southeast Michigan, you know, so you would probably want certain sections at a time, but they all, have databases and a number of them are online where you can go in and look at it and uh, um, for uh, super fun sites and state equivalent sites. So there's another version of a, of a hazardous waste site there. Thank you. Uh, Jim asks, what are the prospects of developing environmental certification of every step in the production of things from the shovel to the shelf? I think that's high. I think there are a lot of, you know, you know, some of the by sector, you take the energy sector, you take the chemical sector, you talk automobile sector, you take steel sector, 
and there's like trade associations working with them and, and looking at um, uh, design for environment, looking at all the steps and what are the environmental impacts, the environmental burden from that, and then full cost accounting, you know, uh, as well. So there are tools out there that are being used. Um, it, but it, it also always frustrates me is that you can have a bad actor out there. You could have a sort of a, uh, an industry that doesn't, isn't ethical or moral relative to the environment. And, and they will uh, try to have a short-term gain, financial gain, but then if, if they go under or if they leave, then, then we're left with cleaning it up and that's gonna fall to the public to figure that out, you know? Sandra um, asks, um, you know, she states first, Amazon is a great company size wise, um, big to start using this method. Um, and I would hope they will tout it in their advertising. Then the question, do you know of any other companies committing to using the precautionary principle? I think there are, you know, you look at, um, the kind of these sustainability reports and these health and safety reports of different corporations, um, they are clearly, I, I would say the, the, the good example of that are, are some of the chemical industries. They think of all the toxicologists and chemical engineers looking at, at, at these issues. And, and they realize that, do you really want to go through a, 50 or a hundred million dollar cleanup again, or can we do it right the first way? So I think uh, chemical industry, there's some of them, there's always an exception to the rule, but uh, many of them are, are really um, trying to do the right thing. And, and science and, and trade associations and university research is helping guide that along. I was actually just having, um, I see Bernie asked a question uh, and I'm gonna to get to that in a second, Bernie, but um, and, and this isn't, pro this might not be the precautionary principle, but I was talking to someone today that um, I was working on recently with just kind of the Sierra Club outings work. Um, we did a, an ice climbing trip up uh, um, to, to Munising and um, uh, he, he actually was able to get some sponsorship from Patagonia and um, you know, I, I think of like Gore-Tex and the waterproofing materials, and I'm sure that's wrapped into the outdoor industry. But one thing that I, I've noted about Patagonia um, is they, they are trying to like really promote the idea of like durable goods, you know, like we want you to buy our jacket and our jacket to be something that lasts for a long time. You know, maybe you'll never have to buy another jacket like it or please encouraging people to repair um, as opposed to just disposing of it and, and buying a new one. Um, there's issues around sort of like like wealth and, and access to expensive gear like Patagonia, but um, I don't know if that's precautionary principle, but it is an example of like this capitalistic company saying, you know, we, we, we want our products to last. Yeah, there's another example of that, Garrett, and that's like carpet companies, you know, there's some real progressive carpet companies that, you know, think of what carpets are made of today, you know, you know, they're, they're you know, they're petroleum based organic you know, compounds. And so some of the progressive ones are actually um, figuring out how do we, after use of the product, we will take it back, recycle it and make it into cradle to cradle. So I think what we need are leaders in that area. We need some, um, you know, corporations like Amazon and Patagonia and and others to be leaders. And then they will have, I hope, a competitive advantage down the road and they will pull the other ones along as well. Because yeah, it, it can even like have a ripple effect beyond, you know, just the, um, the, 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 the pollution and the health of our in, environment in terms of chemicals and, and sourcing materials. But like, I think of, in terms of like sourcing materials, like um, in terms of where you get your down feathers from, right? In terms of like mm -hmm. the humane raising uh, or caring of animals and the conditions that the workers are, are going, you know, are, are living in and working in, it can really sort of ripple out from there. It can be powerful. Absolutely. It could be very powerful and, 
And, um, and then if, you know, if, when you do have a settlement, if, if we could charge the full cost of cleanup to them, and if we could, you know, have some disincentive or some incentive, <laughs> disincentive to not do the same thing all over again, right? You know, they have to feel the pain for this. And, you know, I think uh, uh, there was a recent settlement um, of Marathon, the only refinery in Michigan left, and they had a, a settlement on air uh, emissions violations, and it was a small token amount of money. And 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 you know the, what's the incentive to change? You know what I mean? That there's no incentive to change there. And then there's all those people in Southwest Detroit that are living. It's an environmental justice issue as well. You know. Yeah. Well, well, Bernie's question is: uh, Is there any news on Zug Island with pollutants like benzene causing high rates of asthma and cancer? Yeah. Probably the big news. Um, was the old channel cleanup. And so um, under the Great Lakes Legacy Act, US EPA came in and did a $50 million cleanup of the sediments. You know, the, the, the Rouge River used to come down and as it would get to the mouth, it would meander back and forth, right? And so the old channel was what went around Zug Island, you know? Um, Zug Island was not an island at one time. It only became an island when they built the shipping channel to get up to the Rouge Basin, you know, in the early 1900s. So when they did that, that became Zug Island, you know. So the big news, I guess, would be the cleanup of those contaminated sediments. And then um, uh, there are lots of issues on Zug Island that have to be dealt with. And I don't even think we know all of them, but we know it's bad. That gets us to the, um, that's all we've gotten through all the comments and the questions in the chat. Are there any other comments or questions that folks have while we've got John here with us? Well, thank you, uh, everyone. It's, it was a pleasure to be with you. And if we could uh, do something on this issue or another issue, uh, 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 Jerry and Garrett know how to reach me. So it's a real pleasure to be with you and thank you for all you do. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. And you knew how to reach Jerry and us. So if there's an idea that you think we should really seize on and try to move forward and spread with our, uh, you know, share with our members with Southeast Mission Group and the Sierra Club, please, John, don't hesitate to reach out to, to try and um, use us. Will do, Garrett. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Join us. Oh, Shannon, I see. I don't know. Is Shannon still on here? Mm.